going on guys? It's Quizzy Dog here and in today's video we're going to be taking a look at the Hisense U88G also known in the US market as the U8G. Now instead of making a very long and kind of drawn out video talking about absolutely everything to do with this TV I'm going to do this in the benefit of you as well as for viewer attainment or retainment. I'm going to actually chop this down into a bunch of small micro productions. So these can and may include Xbox Series X gameplay, PS5 gameplay, Apple TV 4K Gen 2 feedback as far as how it relates video quality wise into the HDMI 2.1 versus the built in Android 10 smart TV. We're gonna go over this video, which is the general impressions after about a month of usage. And if there's anything else that you guys want to see, be sure to leave it in the comments below, as well as the comments in any other video, and I'll try my best to address all of those questions. But let's, of course, get into the overview of this TV. You can see the TV right behind me. I've been using this for probably about four to six weeks now. And so far, I am absolutely impressed. What Hisense did here is they made a high level, a high competing TV at that mid grade or slightly budget oriented price. Now, some of you will disagree and say that the price tag and of course pricing and availability will be in the links below, but the price tag is not attainable for everybody and I get that. But the feature set that this is offering compared to the same feature set from other manufacturers, this right now is probably one of the cheapest options and from what I've seen in general reviews and just feedback I've got from other owners as well as my own feedback and my own experiences, this is definitely one of the options that you guys, if you don't already, should absolutely have on your radar. Now, we're gonna first take a quick overview of the back of the TV. Nothing terribly special. You will see that it is pretty well just a deck textured sort of soft plastic. Um, build quality is, I think, above subpar, but not quite as premium as I may have liked it to be. But again, we're looking at Hisense trimming some unnecessary costs here to hit the price point that they were looking at competing with. The rear IO is very, very capable. We have just as a quick overview, and I'm gonna label all of this stuff on screen as well, but we do have a USB 3.0 as well as USB 2.0. Would have liked to see two 3.0 ports, but again, we're trimming costs to make sure that this maintains that attainable buy-in experience. The HDMI ports we do have uh, all addressed on the side now, which I think is fantastic. In the past, I've seen more IO kind of facing the back of the TV and kind of going into the wall where a 90 degree connector may have been required. In this case, we do have a lot more side addressed ports, but looking at the HDMI ports, we do finally have HDMI 2.1. So there's two HDMI 2.1 ports and then two HDMI 2.0 ports. Now, for me personally, and for a lot of people out there as well, I would have liked to see four HDMI 2.1 ports, but the technology required with the individual or extra switch to make that possible, those are costly parts. And again, at the end of the day, we're looking at a very specific price to performance equation here. They will have the U9DG that's coming out that's a brand new dual layer technology. And my hopes are that they're gonna go with four HDMI 2.1s at that pricing category. But here we just have the two 2.1s and then we have the two 2.0s. One of your 2.1s is your eARC port as well. So if you're like me and you run an AVR that's a little bit older, that doesn't support some of the modern conveniences that you're going to get with the late 2021 releases and maybe a couple that are out at the time of watching this video, you're going to immediately lose one of those HDMI 2.1 ports. And that's kind of a sad point, but it is what it is. Again, I think it's a step that they had to do, but these 2.1 ports, they are full bandwidth. So we are looking at, I believe either 40, if not 48 gigabit per second for the transfer rate. They offer variable refresh rate. They offer 120 Hertz. This is of course, 120 Hertz panel. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. They do have free sync. They do have absolutely everything. And it looks like finally 
they've been aiming their sights at the gaming market with this TV as well as the, the little brother to this and then again going into that new U9DG that's coming out in the future. Uh, the 2.0 ports, of course, they're just standard spec, not too fancy, I suppose, but later on down the line, when those AVRs come out and we see tangible HDMI 2.1 with all the gaming modes not locked behind firmware updates, um, it's going to be less of a concern for me. For myself, I have my Xbox Series X occupying the secondary port, eARC in that primary, going to my AVR, and then my PS5 and my Apple TV 4K both piped into the other ports, the HDMI 2.0. Wi-Fi connectivity, we do actually have 802.11 AC, that is a dual band 2.4 or 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi connection. Speeds are very good, it's very reliable. And then the software itself that this is running, of course, is Android 10, not Google TV. Maybe in the future we'll see that coming to actual TV products and off the standalone Google platform. But Android TV 10 is a more than capable platform. It's plenty fast thanks to the processor that Hisense has in this TV. I've seen no stutters or sidesteps when I'm going through and configuring all of my settings, when I'm trying to change my color calibrations, there's absolutely no slowdown. And that's what I had received previously with my 2019 Hisense. It aged out maybe a little bit quicker than I thought it would be. My Q9 and Q8 series, the G series specifically, they're all running strong. So the Android TV platform with these modern releases, very, very good. And with that as well, you're gonna get some of the creature conveniences that that offers along with the Bluetooth connectivity so you can game on the Android TV platform. It's going to have your Google Assistant in there as well, talk to the remote or talk directly to the TV. They've brought back that Farfield microphone on the front, but if you don't like that, there is a dedicated mute switch that you can enable to make sure that if you're talking to other Googles in the room or just don't want it to hear you in general, you can go ahead, you can turn that feature off. Off. The legs, I don't tend to use legs on the TV, but it's a similar styling to what we saw on the previous generations as well. And then I guess rounding out the back, because this has been a little all over the place, is a nice little cable channel. If you do want to write your cables, I just willy nilly throw mine. I really don't care that much. But for you tidy freaks, it is there and it will help you route the cables fairly well. Now, looking at the front of the TV, we do of course have that 65 inch. 120 hertz native display. So this does do motion rate 480 as far as the motion interpolation or whatever it is you wanna call it, that fake motion. It is actually really good on this. I find that failing on more and more TVs as far as giving a very bad blooming or soap opera effect. Nothing really identified or noticed on this one here. Little bit of choppiness, but I tend to turn most of that off anyway. Uh, but the 120 hertz panel, this will allow you to operate anything that's capable within that HDMI 2.1 port to give you full 120 hertz, whether it's gaming or possibly content that might come out in the future. It is there and it works very well. Powering that IPS display as well is 360 backlit zones. So this is up from the previous generations that were in the 200s, in the high 100s. I think the last 65 inch was 180 if I'm not mistaken, but that could have been the 55 that I had. But then we've seen TVs as low as like 60. And I mean, it's plain and simple. The more backlight zones you have, the better control it has with contrast. So and blooming and I guess all the rest of that stuff as well. So seeing 360 zones, theoretically larger number means better performance and that definitely rings true here. Having this at full brightness, your HDR content is going to absolutely pop with the advertised 1500 nits of brightness. That is so much brighter than most TVs that I see again in this pricing category. And at max brightness, I also don't find that it blows out the colors. It actually maintains your contrast exceptionally well. The details retain, the color accuracy is there. It's not skewed by the backlight. And that's something, again, I don't normally see in these pricing categories. So seeing all of that gets me very excited. And you can tell that I'm excited. These are not scripted. This is just my general feedback, opinion, impressions. Uh, overall, super, super impressive. Now, 
Speaking of the backlighting system, you will lose some of that brightness if by chance you are gaming on the modern consoles and have this into game mode. So it does have the option to go into ALLM or auto low latency mode. You can turn that on and off, but I myself have that turned on. That's simply going to self-identify whether or not you have gaming oriented content and you're playing it. It's going to switch that and that's going to optimize that refresh rate down to as low as six milliseconds, which is absolutely crazy. We were seeing TVs in 2020 that impressed us that had 14 milliseconds. To get us to a sub 10 and close to five is just, it's obnoxious. But the trade-off, of course, depending on the content that you're playing, is having that game mode with free sync and everything that this offers enabled, you will lose some of that brightness, you will lose some of the control of that backlight system. So just keep that in mind, that could of course change with future updates, but when you have something that ends up manipulating how the TV functions, how it's going to show light, how it's going to do all the fantastic things, that can introduce latency. Now for story-driven gamers, uh, those looking that for the narrative experience like I am, maybe racing games, things that don't need fine-tuned precision like FPS or something that is going to have quick time events, you can turn the game mode off. You can put this in any other mode that you want, and we're going to address the modes in a future video as well. And you're going to have full backlight capabilities and all that fun stuff. But for me, when I game, I actually want that precision. I want that timing, so I don't mind if it dims down just a little bit. Now, continuing on the, the topic of gaming, and again, I'm going to address this in standalone videos as well. The ghosting is pretty much absolutely non-existent. Uh, when you get this TV, if by chance you're watching this before you buy or you've recently purchased and wondering maybe why there are a couple of very small minute faults, there are some things that you're going to have to do to optimize this experience. So one is making sure that your firmware and your software is completely up to date. Of course, optimizations are coming out from all vendors, including Hisense, as often as they can to make sure that they're staying relevant with everything that they can offer. So for me personally, when I first got this TV and booted it up, I tried Spider-Man Miles Morales on my PS5. I didn't capture that footage, unfortunately, uh, we're going to revisit that to see if it's still present. But I noticed that at 4K60 in the uh, ray tracing performance, I did see a little bit of ghosting, not on Spidey himself, but in the birds that were flying in the sky. They were, of course, very dark colors and they were on a very bright background when that game was displaying daytime. And I found that there was a little bit of trail with the wings when they would flap. A couple of ways that I worked around that, of course, we did the firmware updates that introduced some new software that fixed a lot of those concerns. And the other thing as well is we actually went ahead and enabled TCON. Now I'm going to show a quick screenshot of what that looks like when it's enabled. And honestly, I don't fully understand what the TCON is or what it does, but essentially what my take is, and I'll, I'll put a proper description in the video description of this content, but it looked like it sort of enabled a service menu to then get additional software downloaded. This was done by going into searching for new software and hitting up on the actual remote control four times, enable TCON, it will let you know that the TV has to reboot and all that fun stuff. And I noticed that after that, everything got insanely smooth, including some of the picture profiles. Again, we're going to talk about in later content. So if you have this TV, if you're looking at the TV and maybe you feel like there's a little bit of motion concern or you're doing some research and it says there's motion, motion concern, just go in, do your software updates, enable the TCON. And for me, that honestly fixed it right up. The rest of the content, absolutely fantastic. As far as watching TV, watching movies. This has your full gamut of upscaling to up to 4K resolution. We have HDR10, we have Dolby Vision, we have every picture profile you could want, and the picture profiles work very well. We're gonna go over those again in another video, 
But for myself personally, most of the sort of B-roll we're gonna capture in this case is primarily going to show you the motion enhancement set to film. And I do that because a lot of the content that I watch is in 24p and it just smooths that out a little bit. There will be motion rates for sports, for different things, but I generally just lock mine to film. That's where I have the best overall experience. And for the actual settings themselves, I typically also leave this for standard HDR content in the theater night mode. I primarily watch down here at night and even in the daytime, it's actually not that bright in here. So theater night really helps balance that aggressive 1500 nits of backlight. I do like a bright TV. It helps adjust the colors to make sure they're not popping off like crazy because the backlight's at 100%. And then that also allows me to use the film mode. Now, for Dolby Vision content, that's gonna be auto-recognized, at least it is for me, and I know for most people using the uh, smart TV features, it will be built into the panel. For me, I'm using an Apple TV 4K, and I have it set up to actually self-identify and change the color codecs and the settings based on the content. So there is a new Dolby IQ setting. What that is doing is that's essentially taking a look at Dolby Vision content that's trying its best to figure out what settings are best optimized per scene, but it also locks out a lot of your fine tuning. So I found that it actually did introduce some pretty yucky artifacts and details when it came to motion interpolation because that as well is locked in a custom format. So I've just gone, I've made my own custom, semi-custom Dolby Vision Kodak and then went ahead or preset I should say and uh, went ahead and enabled the film mode as well. Aside from that, we do have dual 10 watt speakers on here. They're okay. There is an option to go with the wall mount mode that will help bounce that sound off the wall to address it to yourself. If that's disabled, they're bottom mounted speakers and the hopes is that it's going to bounce that sound up off your tabletop or your entertainment center and just amplify and give a little bit more oomph to that sound. I use an AVR, like I mentioned before, we have this piping the eARC, and finally again in 2021, the U88G is able to actually pass through your Dolby Atmos. And that's something that I've never got before on my previous models of televisions and my previous Hisense as well. We only had ARC support, so with that I was sending through like a compressed bitrate format and letting my AVR kind of figure that out. Having the ability to actually enable the Atmos support on this TV means using the extra bandwidth and the extra intelligence within eARC, we're sending that right down to a capable AVR. I think mine is the Onkyo 676, if I'm not mistaken. And for the first time, I'm finally listening to Dolby Atmos content, and it is breathtaking. It's that's a different story. It's not necessarily a TV feature other than the ER capabilities that make that possible, but the sound direction of Atmos is just much more full, much more directional than trying to get the AVR to figure out what it wants to do with a compressed bitrate, kind of open that package and, and figure out that surround sound accordingly. So absolutely love the Dolby Atmos pass-through. Absolutely fantastic. Now, the last thing I want to address is the actual remote control. I know that sounds foolish, and half the time, honestly, I just use my Apple TV remote. Because of the HDMI CEC, it essentially allows almost anything to control this TV, depending on what it is that you want to do. But with this remote, finally, for the first time, and again, premium feature, kind of sub-premium price as far as what they're asking for this TV, we do have a backlit remote. And that just makes it a little bit easier to use and see and interface with at nighttime. You simply press a button, the backlight's gonna activate, it stays on for a couple of seconds, turns itself off to make sure that you're not wasting your battery. And that is a feature that I absolutely love. So I guess my main conclusion, and, and this was maybe more of like a feature, featurette, and just a brief overview of this TV. So far, I am thoroughly impressed. Like in all honesty, pricing and description are down in the video, um, or pricing and availability are in the video description, but this is hitting heavily hard with a lot of the, I guess what you would say, big brands. And at this point, I think over the last couple of years, Hisense has understandably shown the AV community that they are looking to compete with the big boys. 
Their market share, I think they were labeled within the top three in North America as far as sales and volume and stuff like that. They are more than up and coming. They're well established, but they're they're gunning for that number one spot. And when it comes to the feature set on this TV, the fact that the native 120 hertz, all those gaming features are finally there that was missing on the last year Q8G, Q9G launch, which were the H9G and H8G launch. Um, we're fully able to utilize that uh, HDMI 2.1 with the 120 hertz screen. It's bright, it's bold, it's beautiful. I am just absolutely floored with what this TV has to do. So with all that being said, hopefully you found uh, this video a little insightful, maybe amping you up for the future content to come. Again, I will be going over some kind of subcategory videos in the future for the Xbox Series X and TLDR. Before that comes out, I will tell you that this is fully capable of absolutely everything that the Series X has to throw at it. We're gonna go over gameplay on the PS5. I will be wiring that into the HDMI 2.1 so you can see some examples, at least right now, of how that operates at 120 hertz without the variable refresh rate and kind of the things that I think it needs to do that well. That's not a TV concern, that's PlayStation being poor with their release schedule and hiding key sellable features behind firmware, but that's a different story for a different day. We're gonna go over some content comparisons with HDR, with HDR10, with Dolby Vision, and then maybe based on what you guys leave in the video comments, maybe we'll do some other content as well. I've had some people ask if I could explain kind of what all the video modes are, so maybe we'll go over that. But in conclusion, U88G, Canadian market, U8G, US market, it should be on your radar. If you don't have one and you're looking for a 120 hertz capable gaming oriented TV that will just make your content absolutely pop and soar off the screen, I really, really, really cannot recommend this enough. And again, there are better TVs. I don't wanna sound biased. There are, there will always be a better TV to the point that you get to the best TV, but those TVs are honestly either sacrificing one or two things like brightness, like motion smoothing, like having your variable refresh rate, your V-Sync, all of that stuff locked behind firmware that we don't know whether or not it's gonna come out. There's gonna be things that fault other panels and the panels that have it all, they are at this point almost unattainable. This is probably the smartest purchasing decision that I've made as far as looking at a TV in 2021. And I've looked at a lot. My heart has been with the Hisense brand for a little bit of time. They've given me a shot as a small creator, but going into this, into this as unbiasedly as I possibly can, I've looked at other TVs, I've gone into Best Buy, I've done online research, I've looked at the Artings, and this thing just is fantastic for the price. Again, there will be better TVs. Of course, there will always be better TVs. It may have a four HDMI 2.1 ports. It may have whatever the case may be. It may be an OLED that has slightly better game response time, but they're always going to carry a larger price tag. And this guy here, I think, has everything in every key category that somebody wants while still keeping money in your wallet to maybe buy that AVR you're looking at or hell, maybe buy that 3060 GPU or that 3000 series in general, 3060 is just what is on my mind because Best Buy stock today, but I was making this video so I couldn't go pick them up. Uh, maybe it will help you buy that next gen console. Um, I think saving a bit and going with something that still outperforms almost everything in the higher price category, taking the necessary sacrifices that we need to take to make this an attainable price, I think it's all an exceptionally valid payoff. So, that's my ramble, that's my rant. I should script these, but I totally do not because I want to remain integral and I want to just talk to you guys as if I'm talking to you in my living room. So if you like this video, go ahead and give it a like. Make sure that you leave a comment in the video description or the video comment section about what you might wanna see going forward with this TV with some of the micro content. If there's something that you want answered, let me know and we'll try to fit it in video form. Pricing and availability will be in the video description as well. And until 
the next video. My name is Crazy Dog. You guys, as always, you've been so awesome. Thanks for letting me take a break. Thanks for letting me de-stress. We're back. We're getting it. We're hitting it. Stay tuned. Hit that bell for all the future releases, and I will catch you all in my next video. Take care.